I can't believe it. A Nobel Prize. Do you know that guy? We went to the university at the same time. But then I felt that research wasn't producing anything. So I stupidly left academia to work on gamma detectors. And now look, he lives on top of the Carmel in the expensive neighborhood. And he looks good. And he has a beautiful wife. And he speaks nicely. And he was already rich. But now he's getting a one and a half million dollar Nobel Prize. You still have your PhD, Daddy. I mean, you're still the only nuclear physicist I know. Nonsense. I'm at the end of my career. I'm practically finished. My life is done. Two years ago, when I needed the heart surgery, you and your sister saved me, only to let me live a useless life. You're getting a little melodramatic here, Daddy. Look, have you thought about doing some volunteering? Ugh, I see these volunteers. I can't work for free. I need to get paid, even if it's just a little bit. If people aren't willing to pay me, then I don't feel appreciated. When you were recovering from your heart surgery, I remember you said the only way you would be happy is if you could go back to Israeli dancing. And now you're dancing three times a week. I'm allowed to change my mind. The point is, soon I'm going to retire. And what do I have to show for it? Do you really need more? I mean, you have a pension. You live in a comfortable apartment, which you own. You can drive to a restaurant, have a delicious meal, including dessert, without worrying about the cost. To many people, that would be a luxury. And if I was in their shoes, I would feel even worse. Do you know the story about the rabbi and the goat? Which one? Here's the quick version. There once was a farmer who complained to his rabbi, my house is too small. My wife and three daughters are all squished in one tiny room. What should we do? So the rabbi says, take a goat from the yard, bring it into your house. So the farmer's like, what, a goat? But the rabbi insists and tells him to come back in a week. So a week goes by, the farmer comes back completely stressed out and says, there's absolutely no way. We're so cramped, it's so tight. Rabbi, there must be a better solution. So the rabbi says, I have the perfect solution, but you have to do exactly what I say. So the farmer agrees. The rabbi says, bring another goat into your house and come back in a week. So the farmer comes back and this time he's even worse, completely exhausted, horrible, with huge bags under his eyes. And he tells the rabbi, I don't know what to do. The goats are eating the furniture. They smell, they keep us up all night. So the rabbi says, okay, now get rid of the goats and come back in a week. So the next week, the farmer has a huge smile on his face, looking relaxed, well-rested, super happy. He says, rabbi, life is so good. Our house is so big. We have so much room. Thank you for making me so happy. <laughs> Of course I know that story. That's a good story. But you missed the second part of the story where the farmer walks by his neighbor's house and notices that it's twice as big with a swimming pool in front of it. <laughs> <sighs> well, I think the point of the story is that there's one absolute sure way to have enough. By getting some goats? <laughs> no. <sighs> the way to not only have enough, but more than enough, is to be grateful for what you have. Well, obviously you should be grateful for what you have. Everybody knows that, Hanan. But being grateful doesn't change the reality that the farmer's house is small. The reality is that the farmer's house is what it is. But until the farmer was grateful, he didn't even really have the house he lived in. He was homeless. Hanan. Just because the farmer wanted more doesn't make him homeless. But Daddy, don't you see by being stuck on what he wanted, he wasn't able to benefit from the house he already had. I would argue that being grateful is the only way to actually get any benefit out of life at all. And I'm not talking about being grateful like something you check off a list, like brushing your teeth. I'm talking about actually stopping and recognizing, actually seeing what you have. I see very clearly, Hanan, and anybody that lives in a tiny house is going to be miserable. What about your friend Kalina? She lives in a tiny apartment. She's like barely able to pay her rent. Is she miserable? Kalina? No, for some reason, she usually seems pretty happy. Why do you think that is? I don't know, because she plays with her granddaughter. She doesn't think about her problems, but she's obviously being naive. She doesn't realize how bad things are. She's blind. Well, you have two grandchildren. Ah, I don't know how to relate to them. I'm old. They can't understand me. I can't understand them. I missed my opportunity. Daddy, you're so focused on what you think you've lost and what you think you can't get that you're completely ignoring what's going on right now. Right now, I'm depressed. That's what's going on right now. Yeah, but you're depressed because you're regretting leaving academia, which is the past. And you're worrying that you won't ever be able to live on top of the Carmel, which is the future. But what about right now? Is there anything really wrong right now? Here you go again with that fancy schmancy philosophical mishikas. It's one of the many talents you have with which to impress the women. But you can't relate to my situation, Hanan. Let's see this for what it actually is. I'm never going to win the Nobel Prize, and I'm never going to be rich, and that's not going to change. What problem do you have that's not going to change? How about the fact that I've had eczema all my life? I've seen every specialist. There's nothing they can do. Yes, you have bad skin. It's terrible. We all know it. What's your point? 
When I was a teenager, you would sit across from me at breakfast, scanning my face, saying, I feel so bad for you with your skin. Who is going to want to be with you? You know, I was always afraid to ask girls out because I was so worried that they would be turned off by my skin. And I was just trying to be sympathetic to your problem. But it made me feel terrible. You have bad skin. I wish there was something I could do. But you can't expect me to pretend that you don't have bad skin. Besides, you somehow managed to find a beautiful wife in the end. She doesn't even notice my skin. Well, then she's blind. Maybe all of these people that you think are blind are actually seeing something that you don't. I'm not going to become one of these funny people and pretend that your skin is good. Do you know how I met my lovely wife? Some kind of music thing. We met at a classical concert and the music was so beautiful. And I told her why I love Mozart so much. And when the music was playing and I spoke to her about Mozart, I was there in the moment filled with so much love and appreciation. And that's what she saw, because that's what I saw, and that's who I was. And we were connected in timelessness. Oy, Hanan, do you want me to throw up? Believe me, I'm well aware of the fact that you know how to talk to women about art and music. So, a beautiful woman fell in love with you. Wow, you sure know how to make someone feel better. But Daddy, I didn't go to the concert to meet anybody. I was wearing an old t-shirt, checkered shorts, and sandals. I went because I genuinely love the music. But you still met your wife. But my skin was still bad. What's your point? My point is that if I had been miserable about the fact that I was born with bad skin, I would be stuck in the past. And if I had been worried about what people would think of my bad skin, I'd be stuck in the future. Either way, I would have been preoccupied with the reality of my expectations instead of the reality of that very moment. What do you mean reality of your expectations? The reality of my expectations is the past and the future as I imagine it. It's what I think life should have been, the way it all was supposed to have worked out, or it's what I feel entitled to have, or what I'm afraid I'll never get. Oh, now you know how I feel. Of course, I also get stuck in the reality of my expectations, but daddy, that's not reality. That's in your head. That's all your ego. The reality is that life is what it is, and it's up to you to find a way to deal with it. But the first step is to get out of the future or the past and just be in the present moment. First of all, I have no idea what you just said. And secondly, how does this have anything to do with meeting your wife? Well, imagine if I had stayed depressed about being born with bad skin. First of all, I probably wouldn't have even gone to the concert. But even if I had, I would have been so preoccupied with my expectations that I wouldn't have been flexible enough to see what was actually presenting itself to me in the moment. The beautiful music, the lovely evening, the woman sitting next to me. To really get the most out of life, you have to be in the moment. You have to be present. And I can think of one absolute sure way to be in the present moment. By being grateful. I was appreciating the music. That's what I saw. And that's what she saw. It's easy for you to say, Hanan, but you were born with bad skin. You've had it all your life. But I used to be at the top of my career. My life was full of potential. And I can't get that back. You haven't lost anything significant in your life. I wasn't going to tell you this story, but now I think it might do some good. When we found out we were pregnant, I was so happy, I actually started to sob. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody about the pregnancy for three months to be on the safe side, but I couldn't resist, so I started telling strangers on the subway, my wife is pregnant. Then we went for a sonogram and discovered that it was a blighted ovum. A what? A blighted ovum. The doctor explained that it was an empty sack, that the body reacted to it as a pregnancy, but that there was nothing in the sack and it was going to come out as a miscarriage. The doctor even offered a pill to get rid of the pregnancy so we wouldn't have to wait for it to come out on its own. How come I never heard about this? Because it would have just made you sad and angry and because it was between me and my wife. So what did you do? We grieved. We grieved for five weeks over our loss. And then when nothing came out, we went in again and the doctor realized she had made a mistake and she said we had a beautiful, healthy baby. What? She miscalculated the date of conception and the embryo was too small to see. And she based the blood work on the miscalculated date. So she thought it was a blighted ovum. That's terrible. It's criminal. What actions did you take? I was also angry at first. And if I would have stayed with that, I would have probably told you so we could be angry together and figure out how to get even. But then I remembered that we first thought we had a beautiful baby, and then that was taken away from us. We believed we had lost it, and then it was given back to us again. Daddy, I was so humbled by the experience because I realized how little is in our control. And I suddenly became 
filled with gratitude. What about the doctor? The doctor made a mistake. We switched doctors. The point is, our son was born. You have a son that loves you. That's a very good reason to be happy, Hanan. Daddy, you also have a son that loves you. But your son is a baby, and you're grown up. Hanan, you can't relate to my situation, because you simply have so many things you get enjoyment from. But there are so few things I get enjoyment from, and those few things are relatively minor things. There's nothing that I can really appreciate these days, Hanan. Besides, of course, the things that I can't get. Are you sure about that, Daddy? I remember two years ago when you were sitting on the hospital floor with your back against the wall, huddled in a blanket because the only way you could sleep was with your back perfectly vertical because your heart was failing and your lungs were filling with fluid and it made you cough uncontrollably. I remember when all you kept saying was, I can't sleep, I keep coughing, if only I could stop coughing. I saw you suffering so much and all I wanted was for you to be able to breathe. And when I went to bed that night, as I was scratching, I stopped for a moment to say thank you that I can breathe. Do you remember when you were not able to breathe? I do. Stop for a second and take a deep breath right now. Can you breathe? Yes. If there was anything good about that horrendous experience, it would be that by getting your breath back, you now have the chance to truly appreciate breathing in a way that most of us can't. That is, of course, if you choose to see it. Be grateful, Daddy. Express it. Feel it. Every day. It'll connect you. And I think it'll make you happier. When did you get to be so smart? I didn't invent this, Daddy. This is ancient wisdom. People have been talking about it for thousands of years. We just need to keep repeating it to each other. Speaking about repeating, tell me again what you said about Mozart. I thought it made you want to throw up. It's not for me, Hanan. It's for Galina. I'm going to invite her out to dinner. I'll join you. Ah, now you're forgetting another ancient wisdom. Two is company. Three is a crowd. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Wait till I tell Galina about the fancy Mozart schmancy beautiful of the timeless and the music and the beautiful schmancy.